Hey everyone, welcome to Home Therapy. It's your host, Anita Yokoda. This is the podcast where we break free from our negative thoughts about our home and ourselves. As a licensed therapist and interior designer, I'm committed to bring you raw, relatable, and revealing home therapy sessions to help renovate the real in all of us. But guess what? It won't be all serious business. I love having fun. So we're going to definitely include the ridiculously crazy and funny moments we all experience at home. From DIY fails to spontaneous paint jobs and even discussions on how to decide on a style with your partner, how to motivate your kids to organize their spaces. Sound familiar? I get it. Even as a designer, I'm right here with you, navigating through these challenges and sharing the journey. New episodes drop every Tuesday, so get comfy, sink into your couch, because this is the place to get your home therapy. One session at a time with me, Anita Yokoda. Thank you for joining us today. This is going to be just such a fun conversation. These amazing ladies here. So welcome to the Complete Healthy Home, How to Impact Your Client's Vitality. I'm Julie Ireland, an interior design architect, product designer, and the founder of Home Renovation School. I think it's time for some introductions, right? Yeah. Let's start with you, Anita. My name is Anita Yokoda, and I was for 20 years, a licensed marriage and family therapist, still am. So I help clients make sense of their story. Now as an interior designer, I help them tell it through interior design. So I'm so happy to be here with Julie and my friends and all of you to discuss how to make your home a therapeutic environment and to feel awesome. happy. That's awesome. Kara. Yeah, I'm Kara Newhart. I'm a designer, contractor, and DIY queen. And my mission is to empower people to take charge of creating spaces that support all aspects of their everyday life. So a lot of DIY, a lot of encouraging women to pick up power tools and get hands on. But also um, I host a podcast that's all about design strategy and kind of really learning to think of your home as an environment versus an after. So yeah and then natalie our 2023 sustainable winner award winner over here my name is natalie and together with stacy who's in the audience we own shine interior design studio we have both residential and commercial design um, and offer full service design for both of those sectors and we have really found a passion for creating healthy home environments and it's really been eye-opening to think about the process of what goes into our homes and what we're truly putting in homes. Um, let's get started. So I'd love to start the discussion off by exploring how we creatively tackle indoor air quality. This is so important. So Anita, yeah. how do you design spaces that are visually appealing, healthy, and support well-being through improved ventilation? Well, I'm not sure if everybody knows this fact or not, but the A reports that we spend indoors 90% of the time. That's a lot of indoor air that not necessarily is um, free and clear. So for me as a designer, obviously windows and doors to invite the outdoors air and fresh air in is great, but I've learned that skylights, if the structure allows for it, is a wonderful way to bring that ventilation and the natural light that we need so much wow. for our serotonin levels, for that vitamin D that helps us with the circadian rhythm for sleep. All of these things are intertwined. So my go-to are skylights. Yeah, there's nothing better than natural light, right? <laughs> okay, Natalie, as a sustainability award winner, what design strategies do you prioritize to ensure optimal indoor air quality in your projects? So I think for us, it's all about what the client needs and what they're asking for and setting that goal and then working through what goes in at every layer from construction all the way down to the artwork, what all is going in the house and what it's going to contribute to the air quality of the home. Because sometimes you pick up the sample and you smell it right away. And you just right. know. That VOC. And, but sometimes you have to dive in a little bit more, but it affects everything from the first building layer to the building systems. You have to think and lay all of that out, set those goals, and then follow them all the way through. 
project. Kara, as our DIYer over here, how do you recommend integrating like plants like yeah. into your environments that you design? Yeah, the short answer is put plants everywhere. Anywhere you can put a plant, put a plant. <laughs> Um, no, but I think plants, you first need to look at lighting. I think a lot of people make the mistake of putting it in a dark corner because they saw it on an inspo photo and it can't live there. Right. So look at your lighting and then also maintenance. There's an ongoing maintenance with plants. So you have to know like how capable are you of taking, taking notice of the plant, taking care of the plant. But there's easy options like snake plants. You could ignore it for two months and it would still thrive. And those are actually one of the best ones in terms of clearing your air and also ZZ plants. So if you need two to start out with, try those. And yeah, light, and if you kill it, get another one. Yeah, I'm one of those people that kills it. Literally, I design like landscapes, but you guys, I, I can't keep anything alive. Like, even succulents, yeah. even air plants. Like, I- You may be loving I, them too much yeah, though. <laughs> Overwatering is. <laughs> Not good at it. Can't be good at everything, okay? Let's talk a little bit about sustainable and non-toxic materials and how you're using them in your design projects because this is another thing that's super important that, and I'm super intrigued about. I'm always trying to learn about products and learn more. So, Natalie, what criteria do you use to select sustainable and non-toxic materials for your projects? And then I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit about your process that you go through and how you ultimately kind of bring it all together. So I think sometimes it's not readily available in residential. There's not a label. There are some labels, but you, it might not be just off of the bat. So you have to do your research. You have to learn to read the labels. You have to pull the material safety data sheets and dive into that and actually see what you're putting into the project. And yeah. so sometimes it takes some deeper reading about further than what's just on the sleeve and going deeper and researching those projects. But we always start with a design concept and don't let only what's available drive that. And so start with the concept, dream big, Think yes. about the colors and the patterns and the things that we love to do, and then start to find the things that meet the goals. Like I said at the beginning, that you're setting those goals and then find the products that meet that and bring that together. Yeah, I feel like these shows are so great too because we discover so many great things, you know, at these shows. So that's awesome. Anita, what are some of the ways that you use sustainable design to improve your clients' moods? And So obviously we already talked about natural light ventilation, those are going to really wake up our senses and help us think clear, focus, productivity. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, so anytime I can build out a little bit more of the windows, like a picture window, it doesn't have to be like a spectacular Malibu view, but anything to wake up my client's five senses, that really will guide me and inform me in the environmental friendly and sustainable items. There's even simple ways like aromatherapy and having trays that are beautiful, but having the aromatherapy there for in different corners and nooks. So there's many, many different ways. I don't know, Natalie, if you have heard of this, but I was researching a little bit more and this new product or material, organic materials, they're using mushrooms. Have you heard of that for vegan le leather? So I was really fascinated that as we are evolving in the interior design industry that there's so many sustainable materials. Yeah. That's so cool. And it's organic. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those are some ideas. Wow. I think, yeah, incorporating the five. I'm going to remember that. Yes. Like incorporating the five yes. senses. Like that. How we can stimulate our brain in every chemistry environment. Yeah, is that's how, what cool. drives me with my clients because ultimately as a therapist, I want the relationships in the spaces to thrive. Yeah. That's really my focus. And so how do we use our whole body to be stimulated in a very positive way at home? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Kara, how do you assess sustainability of materials used in your DIY projects? Yeah, that's a really good that's question. Tricky. I think sustainability, like when you say that word, it feels so big. And it's like, how do we actually make that happen day to day, especially when you're doing like a small DIY project? For me, it's like, Rule of thumb, the more natural, the better. And we start there. And so practically that's, you know, repurposing furniture. It's looking nice. for low VOC paint and, and those kinds of tangible things. But I think it's also like just allowing the little things to matter, you know, because it's if, if oh, we I make it that. mean that 
we always have to be doing it perfectly or we always have to be doing like the most sustainable thing, mm. that's really unapproachable and that's not actually gonna work. And I think the best example is like raw wood versus like a wood treated with like a fire resistant coating. It's like that material is innovative, it adds safety, it's gonna let us have houses that are gonna stand for years because they're not gonna burn down as easily. Let's move into talking about, this is super important too, color and sensory elements yeah. are a really important part of what we do as designers, yes. um, how we communicate through the environments that we create. So Anita, can you share an example where a change in color and sensory elements transformed a living space maybe? For yeah, I, I have a really special story to share with all of you. So I, have, I had a client, they had three kids, teenagers and the middle child was struggling with ADHD and he was in his you know teenage whatever ism and so we wanted to reclaim his room for him because he literally was still in his nursery yellow babies RS wallpaper room and he's 16 so we I, I you know because of my therapist background I knew with ADHD there is a misnomer that everything is overstimulating, so we can only use white, we can only use beige. But I think sometimes we're understimulated mm -hmm. and using colors that maybe are more desaturated, so not primary blue, but his favorite color was blue, so we used color blocking for the whole walls, including the closet, and we color blocked his favorite blues, and that calmed him down. We had wow. a corner desk where it wasn't like study time is in the corner, but it gave him a secure zone, so we put zones in a very small bedroom where he could easily access his tasks so he felt organized. So lighting, organization, colors that were a balance for him, down to some aromatherapy. He had a gaming chair. That was a place that he could relax. The desk, we had open shelving where he could put fun stuff on it so it wasn't just about studying. So there was a balance of color, textures, lighting, and organization. So the closet was very organized for a teenage boy to get his clothes so his mom doesn't have to nag him. All of these things put together, he just thrived. And so now he was able to overcome his um, shortcomings and feel empowered mm -hmm. through interior design, right? I think that's just so amazing and cool that now he feels more confident. He's going to school and getting better grades. That's awesome. So it's a, it's a great I story. I mean, design does move us. The yes. colors and textures and all of that does move us. It, it, it reaches our core heart. Yeah. So that, that's so awesome. Kara, how do you choose color schemes for DIY projects that positively affect mood and create sensory rich environments for like your clients? Yeah. The thing about color that I think is interesting is it's so personal. Like what's your favorite color is like yes. the first question you use to get to know someone, but also we spend all of elementary school coloring with crayons and then in middle school they take them away. Yeah. And so people think color is something they're supposed to be immediately good at. And then if they go to the paint wall and they pick a color and it doesn't work, they're like intimidated to try again. First of all, it's just paint. You should repaint it. But also navigating color <laughs> is like... It's a good idea. It's, I tell yeah. people that all the time. It's the easiest thing you can do. <laughs> but navigating color, it's trial and error. It's practice and it's kind of honing your personal vision, but I think rule of thumb wise, always go more muted. I love that tip because I think it looks less like a kindergarten classroom, less intense. Always ground with greenery. If you look at color in nature, it's surrounded by greenery. And so I think oh, for I our brains that. and our eyes, if you add green, it just gives it context. Natalie, can you discuss a project where the use of color and sensory elements was critical to the design outcome? Tell us a little bit about the challenges that you face and kind of how you overcame them. Absolutely. So we have a client who has mast cell activation syndrome. And so her body overreacts to chemical reactions. She has a severe latex allergy. And so she just stays overstimulated because her body reacts. She has to deal with the medical implications of that. And so one of the supportive advice tips that her physicians and her care team had given her was to create an environment that was as calm and soothing as it could be, to give her a retreat so her body could rest, so that she could fight better. And we think of that a lot in terms of healthcare or those sorts of situations, but to bring that concept into your own home, that it can support healing, 
and it can support yes. peace in your mind and in your heart. It was also providing those peaceful tones, the textures, the feel of something when your body's just think about when you're itchy or, you know, you've overreacted to something or you have something that's bothering your skin. You want those things that are soft to the touch, things that comfort you. And so making that combination of it looks good. And for us, a challenge was this client brought us a project and they're like, we want it to be Southern traditional. And so to find something and to find materials that's not something that's very easy to go get off the shelf. That we looked for cottons and linens and those natural fibers, just yeah. as, as bare as you could get, and it really came together in just a beautiful way. And that's the biggest compliment to me is when she's like, it's so peaceful, I feel so rested. And that's very yeah. a way we can support health and healing. Let's go into the big word, biophilic design, <laughs> yeah. natural biophilic, lighting. Biophilic, yes. Okay, because it has so many benefits. Lighting just has so many benefits. So, Anita, how do you balance artificial and natural lighting in spaces with limited access to natural light? Okay, unpopular opinion, or maybe not, but I, every time we, this is so simple, but every time we add recess lighting to, to rooms, the clients, it doesn't matter who it is, always the same reaction. They always say to me, I can't believe we didn't do this sooner. Mm -hmm. For me, yeah. I want to provide spaces that have ample lighting so they can get their done, right? Like, <laughs> you want to get stuff done. So in common rooms, like living rooms and family rooms and kitchens, you need the recess lighting. So that's artificial, especially when there's not as much natural light anyways. I'm sure all of you have noticed, there are so many amazing LED operated lights now that don't even need plugs. They're Wi-Fi operated, but the picture lights, yeah. there's little lamps that you can put on your kitchen countertops, yes. bathroom countertops. Then there's this wall sconces that, I don't know, some even have 3M sticky things. Like, And yeah. they're actually hardy and durable, and it adds that task and ambient lighting that we all crave and need, and it's pretty. So that, I think, is my little trick of balancing it when there's not enough natural light. Natalie, can you explain the concept of biophilic design, that big <laughs> word again? Tough word, yes. right? yes. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna have a test afterwards. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> what role does natural lighting play in your sustainable design projects, and how do you maximize its benefits? Okay, so, we talked about the biophilic design and the, and the connection to the outdoors. And while I think we do that, even in our built environment in our homes, we're so insular. We build a house, we seal it up tight, and we have wonderful yeah. windows and everything that's, and then we just keep it stagnant. And so it's adding the plants, but it's also having the views of what's around you, especially if you do oh, yeah. have a Seattle view or you're in the treetops and being able to connect that. The challenge also is a lot of times clients will come to us and they're like, we put all of these windows in our home. And then they are dealing with glare, heat, and those things. Yes. So as designers, we have to look at what those layers, so in the same way Anita was talking about layers of lighting, we bring in layers of how we control the light coming in. And so you have to think about, are allergies a case? Do we need to skip the blinds? Do we need to put them inside the glass? Can we control light? Because if you are dealing with a medical issue or something or a light sensitivity, mm -hmm. you have to be able to control it. So the solution just isn't plants and windows. Yes. <laughs> There's That's so much true. more to it. Yeah. It's thoughtful. It, it really does have to be thoughtfully placed and you have to think about, I know when I'm designing the architecture, whatever, for homes that I do, I'm thoughtfully thinking about where the house is situated and then also what is the view. Kara, can you share a DIY project that successfully brought in an element of bringing like kind of nature indoors yeah. and how you did that. There's actually two. So my first one that's probably my favorite is a window plant shelf to combine both. Oh, it's essentially a plumbing pipe with three or four little like wooden shelves. They can slide in front of the window for the plants to have natural light and then they can swing out against the wall to not block. That one's really easy. You only need two tools. One, if you go to the hardware store and have somebody cut your wood for you, just drill little holes and stack them up. 
My other one is, I like to call it my masterpiece because I can't avoid a good pun, but essentially just like think like a canvas from the craft store and you just layer up different moss, different colors and textures and create a living art piece that's not actually alive in case you aren't good at <laughs> keeping it alive. I love that. I'm actually doing a lot of living green pieces. I don't have to care for them, so that's how they're going to survive. So Anita, as we explore the intersection of ergonomics and home design, I'm super intrigued about the potential for creating spaces that not only promote physical well-being, but also foster an emotional connection and relaxation. So what are some ways that we can use ergonomic design to make our homes more comfortable, help us work better, live better, relax? The living room, instead of having furniture that's ergonomic to the space just for sitting and having it aligned symmetrical or facing the TV, I call it the conversation circle. Dot your living room furniture where you imagine, or maybe your clients already tell you, this is how we converse. This is how we get real face time with the poofs and the stools and the swivel chairs and really making it interactive space because once you put a chair somewhere, someone always finds, it's very, very special. And so thinking of it more of a conversation circle. The dining room, I know for a lot of clients, it's a really not a, active rooms. Even back when I was just doing therapy, I encouraged clients to use that as their communication hub. So pick dining chairs and and um, the table. Have it conducive to more neutral, intimate conversations that the kids know if I need to talk to mom and dad, if there's a family meeting, or if partners have a, a conversation, a heart-to-heart, -heart, this is your communication hub. And from there, you can find the ergonomics that's conducive to the kind of interaction you want. I love that. I love that. Unless you want, to, you want them to sit out there, then you put the chair over in the corner. Yes. <laughs> yes. They have their little You're not in my zone. Room. They have right? a zone. Kara, as a DIYer, how do you create comfortable and stylish home offices? This is a good one because we're all yes. like, I would say most of us are working from home. It has to be everything these days. But yeah. I backed into design the backwards way, right, by doing it myself and then building that mm -hmm. out. So. I always start with function. Like when I was doing my own spaces for myself, I would just sit in the room and list everything I wanted to do in that room. Like what am I gonna actually do? And then once you know how it's gonna work that way, you can figure out how does it need to look and feel. Oh, and I, I think where we go wrong is that we're like, inspo photo, what is it gonna look like? What's the color palette? Yes. And we need to just start with the, the framework and the structure first. So list out what am I gonna actually do, and then you can start to match those elements with actual design things. And also, don't be afraid to change. I think a lot of times when we think of design, we think before, after, and it's not a stagnant after. Like, that after in 10 years is gonna that. be outdated. Yeah. So yeah. you need to get comfortable with the fact that design's a evol like evolving process. It's always gonna change. Your life changes and your phases change, and your seasons change. Like, you can move things around, and that's okay. I love it, that's yeah. true, because we are always changing and growing, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we go to home goods and we just have to have that chair. Yeah. And so we yeah. have to yeah. find a space for it. <laughs> and 90 candles, because right. I, I'm the candle queen. Natalie, how do you balance the aesthetic and functional aspects of ergonomic design in your work? I think that goes back to being very client driven. As designers, we know a lot of times we think of ergonomics as kind of by rote, like an ADA requirement or the height of a chair or the height of a counter. And a lot of times as designers, we have the opportunity to tailor those spaces to somebody and their preferences. We have a client that she's a physical therapist and she has her own thoughts on what like an ADA transfer shower should be. So she had a very specific way that she wanted the bench height because she was considering how she might have to transfer. And so bringing that into our homes and tailoring that, being okay to tweak it a little bit. Yeah. If you're shorter, have a shorter surface. If you're taller, have a taller work surface and be open to tailoring those and creating those spaces for our clients. And they can still look amazing and they can have yeah. that personal touch of you know, a, the scale of a chair that's just right. I'm short, I love a chair where everything fits and my feet <laughs> yes. don't swing. Well, of course. So we, we got through like all of our categories right. here. So that means it's time for Q&A. Anyone have any questions? Hi, out of all the products that you guys have worked with, 
which ones do you personally, is there something that you always kind of go to for that aha therapy product? I, I think for me, I already mentioned the transformative power of using light flooding in from the top. So again, mm. sun tunnels are another option for sky, skylights because oh, yeah. a lot of times the, the just the structural of the roof and stuff. I, I suffer with um, seasonal affect disorder, so I personally know I've had clients with OCD, just that natural light that we really crave, so that's my go-to. I'm really into like the Sonos speakers. They have some that you can actually do behind the drywall, so you get like the sound when you need it, and there's nothing visual when you don't. It's really beautiful. For us, paint has been a big thing that you can influence. It's a huge contributor to your project and we all know the fresh paint smell and sometimes you want that you love it but being able to choose that so we have a sherwin williams product that we like to spec um, almost every line has a wonderful uh, voc free a latex free that's something that we've had to encounter and more people are asking for stuff like that yeah. so having clients ask that has been that is, that's an easy button. I love to incorporate water. Like I'm, I'm always finding some water feature, some way to make, bring in a water, you know, wall fountain or something because there's something just so calming about the sound of water, right? Back to the question about indoor air quality. So I know that we like to use a lot of texture and we're looking to put living walls in place. I'm curious about whether you have any favorite go-tos for dust, basically just air filtration, keeping those environments safe for people, especially with who suffer from allergies. I think we've gotten very okay with seeing, even uh -huh. just having a place, creating a place for the filter, to have a freestanding yeah. filter, yeah. because you can have things for your HVAC, but then you almost need a second layer, and so, We've designed spaces that have a spot for it, and you just embrace that it is there, mm -hmm. and you can make us you can make a place for it. And these days, there's so many aesthetic. They're nice looking. Yeah. They are <laughs> like there's a little leather yeah. strap on them, and it's yeah. like very modern looking, and the colors are Incorporated great. Incorporated in. Yeah. yeah. So actually, it looks like it looks like decor. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It kind of doubles as a sound machine. I have yes. It's just like very <laughs> yes. soothing. It's but, soothing. Yeah. So. Love your air filter. Yeah, yes. a million percent. To piggyback on the allergy question, are there materials beyond clearing the actual air? Like I suffer from dust allergies, so I'm really aware of how some materials will just hold on to stuff. So I'm just curious if you guys have any particular materials you love for their being like hypoallergenic or not holding on to dust mites, things like that. I, I love anything that's breathable and organic, so I tend to use linen bedding and everything for clients. Sleep is so needed in our daily hustle and bustle, so I'm always thinking for clients what kind of bedding routine and just even the bedding itself would help them sleep better, especially people who suffer with allergies. I, yeah things and that are washable. Washable, yeah. yes. So we've done slip covers that are low pile, that natural material. So sometimes we try to, we shy away from that, but being able to launder something is very important, very yeah. powerful to be able to clean that. So to be able to consider those changes and mm -hmm. things like that. And the bedding is a big thing that you can control the choices of the materials yeah. and the certifications, but mm -hmm. being able to wash, wash things yeah. makes a big difference. And then a different angle, sometimes it's not about what to add, it's actually about where to remove. So I've had clients where there's no rugs. So how do you work with people's animals, dogs and cats in those areas in their homes? Talking about go-to rugs, the rugs that I like to choose, especially high traffic for pets and kids, is um, it's almost like a no pile, but it's still soft to touch. It's great. Yep. Easy. Well, with pets for sure, like yeah. free vinyl. Right. Yes. It's like, pff, it's right. a no brainer. No brainer. Yeah. <laughs> and if you have lots of kids, that's a no brainer right. too. That helps. Like, yes. <laughs> tell, they, tell they grow up. Right. Yeah. It's kind of a combination of all of the things that we've yeah. talked about. Pets and kids, almost everybody that comes to you that you're working with are going to have some level of that. And being able to choose those performance. Well, I was just thinking about design on a dime, right? Because yeah. we come across some customers who are in a pinch, and I guess in my experience, the lower in the product, sometimes the more difficult you have with VOC issues, mm -hmm. right? 
So do you have any tips for how to design on a dime being biophilic and also easy on the breathing quality? Mine for that is reworking. Like what can we get that's vintage and real wood and repurposing things. Bringing it current with some new paint and mm -hmm. new finish, so yeah. I love that. There's yeah. nothing that. more sustainable than reusing right. something. Yes. Right. And that is a great way to do it. It takes a little bit more creativity and also educating clients on what is the most important thing to invest in. Yeah. To invest in certain pieces that are the largest contributors, and sometimes that's our built environment. That's the paint, it's the it's the glues, the adhesives, the things that we put tile and showers in. That can be impacted and it might not be as much the furnishings. Mm -hmm. And so it's informing our clients on where to invest and where they can be okay with not spending a lot of money. Hi, so as an interior architecture and design student, we're constantly talking about lots of sustainability and things like that. So what have you found has been one of the most like sustainable and also like affordable like window treatments while trying to implement the biophilic aspects of natural lighting because I know natural lighting can be a little bit harmful sometimes with the glare and stuff like that. So just some ways to work around that. I think of you students whenever, because everybody's always like, lights and plants. <laughs> you know, I put lots of windows in my building, lots of windows in my home. It's to not be afraid of using drapes. Everybody's so scared of them. You're right. They can be taken off the wall and laundered. <laughs> yeah. And people are so afraid of using that, but you have to control the light somehow. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to have those layers. You need to be able to sleep. You need rest. You need that yes. quality quality of sleep that Anita was talking about. So don't be afraid of that. Learn the benefits, the pros and cons. You're all about informing your clients of the pros and cons. And so uh -huh. I always think about that with, with students. And it's like, where's the next step? How do we actually make this happen? Yeah. Yeah, yes. plus draperies and curtains just bring texture and color and, their, and beauty and, and yeah. some depth. They can yeah. raise your, your, your eye. They can make a small space look mm -hmm. bigger and taller, right? Yeah. Any other questions? And that's it. And then we'll see you back at two, right? All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Home Therapy with Anita Yokoda. If this episode resonated with you, consider passing it along to a friend, family member, coworker, or roommate. Spread the love one home therapy session at a time. New episodes of Home Therapy are released every Tuesday. Subscribe to this podcast and never miss an episode. To leave a rating or review of the show, head to Apple Podcasts and let me know what you think. I love hearing from you. Not to mention, you can stay in touch with me throughout the week seeing behind the scenes info and sneak previews of upcoming guests by subscribing to my website, anitayokoda.com. All information about today's show and guests will be linked in the description of this episode. Thanks again for listening. I adore our time together so much, guys. Let's keep our intentions focused and calm. And as always, use your home as therapy.